Hello, my name is Frank Christensen and I'm the coordinator of officials for IFAF in Europe. This is the first of two training tapes dealing with the legal blocks in the back. Today we're looking at kick plays and, and we're going to look at some, some plays to see how it happens and we're going to talk about when is it enough, when is it too much and how are we going to cover these situations. But before we get to the game film, Let's have a look at what the rulebook and the MOFO have to say on this topic. In the rulebook, we go to rule 234, block in the back. In Article 4A says, a block in the back is contact against an opponent occurring when the force of the initial contact is from behind and above the waist. When in question, the contact is at or below the waist. B. The position of the blocker's head or feet does not necessarily indicate the point of initial contact. In Rule 936, also dealing with block in the back, it says, A block in the back, other than against the ball carrier, is illegal. And then there are a couple of, uh, there's an exception. 1. Offensive players who are on the line of scrimmage at the snap within the free blocking zone may legally block in the back in the free blocking zone subject to the following restrictions and then there are two restrictions to the exception a a player on the line of scrimmage within the free blocking zone may not leave the zone return and block in the back and b the free blocking zone disintegrates when the ball leaves the zone additional exceptions two when the player turns his back to a potential blocker who has committed himself in intent and direction of movement. 3. When a player attempts to reach a ball carrier or simulated ball carrier or legally attempts to recover or catch a fumble, a backward pass, a kick or a touched forward pass, he may push an opponent in the back above the waist. Four. When the opponent turns his back to the blocker under Rule 933A1B. 5. When an eligible player behind the neutral zone pushes an opponent in the back above the waist to get to a forward pass. In the MOFO, we go to Section 33, Contact Fouls. Number 5 deals with a legal block in the back. A. Before calling this, apply the same conditions as you would apply for holding, but also apply the conditions for calling clipping, particularly the need to see the entire act. B. If one hand is on the number and the other hand is on the side and the initial force is on the number, it is a block in the back. C. A block that starts in the side and ends up in the back is not a foul as long as there is continuous contact. D. Touching an opponent in the back is not a foul unless it results in him being knocked down or pushed off balance sufficiently so that he stumbles or missteps and misses making a tackle or block. Remember, the foul is for illegal block in the back, not an illegal touch in the back. E. Charging into a player's back away from the play may be called as unnecessary roughness. This may be called regardless of the timing of the block relative to the end of the play. And finally, F. Be particularly alert when you see an offensive player chasing a defensive player and vice versa when the defensive player is not attempting to reach the ball. This is sometimes referred to as the Oreo cookie. And that was the theory. Now let's have a look at some game film. In this first clip, we're looking at number one from the kicking team. So blue, gray, number one on the left side of the field. So right there at the point of attack, he's going to get pushed and, and you know, it'd be, it would be hard pressed to say that this is from the side. So this is, this is in the back and he also falls on his on his face even though he turns uh, after he lands this contact is from the back now you know with the with the invention of the blindside block or the 
uh, the new rule that makes blindside blocks illegal, uh, we have to take a hard look at all uh, blocks in the back because by definition they most bl uh, blocks in the back will be from the blind side so the question is is this forcible enough for a blind side block instead and and I don't think it is I think uh, the force of the contact is with his with his arms and hands uh, we don't see him getting getting blown up the way we would want uh, for a blind side, so this is a uh, this is a block, certainly a block in the back, but not enough for a blind side block. And and who needs to see this? Well, the uh, the deep wing on 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 the left side uh, from this angle would would have the primary coverage of this. I would also expect at this point, since the return has started, uh, that the back judge starts looking at blocks instead of. Uh, only looking at the punt returner, so we have at least a couple of officials who who should and, and could see this. On this play, we're looking at the uh, the receiver or the head hunter uh, far from the camera. You see the classical, uh, the typical Oreo cookie there, where um, the red guy is beat, so he's coming in from behind. And, and what's he going to do? He's going to block in the back. So, uh, and you can see how the uh, the white jersey, his his momentum, is is moving forward because his uh, because the push happened from the back, and we can see that just as well from the end zone camera. From this angle, we're looking at the right side of the screen. He's going to come in right there, and you can tell that the the push is certainly more from the back than from the side, and and the ball is is just arriving now, so this certainly is point of attack and and something that we need to call. On this play, we're looking at the left side of the screen. And what we'll see is number white number 17 coming in there, and this is a, a pretty good example also of a uh, of a block in the back end and the Oreo cookie where we have these three players in the middle. Uh, the play in the middle has a different color than the others. It's an easily recognizable image, uh, and and very typical situation where we get a block in the back. And here, I think it would be tough to to argue that the uh, the brunt of the the contact was from the side, and it certainly impedes uh, White number 17's ability to to make this tackle. So, good call for block in the back. On this play, the action is going to happen on the left side of the field, and the return is going to go there and right there is is the potential so we've got again we've got the oreo where we've got three players and the middle guy has a different color that that a lot of times that's easier to recognize than who needs to block who and who needs to tackle who once you see those three players with the middle guy uh, in a different uh, color jersey that's when we need to to look out and here we've got the uh, the outside guy blocking number that might be number 51 and you can say that he's got well he's got one hand on the shoulder and one hand on the back but if you look at the green player the way he's being pushed that that after the push he's moving forward and that to me indicates that the uh, the, the brunt of the force or the, the the forcible contact not that this is enough for a blindside block but the force of the block is with the right hand in the back, not with the left hand on the side. So this is an illegal block that that, that should be called. And who can see this? Well, the, the referee might be able to see this, the wing official on that side, maybe even uh, the deep wing on this side of the field could have a good, uh, good look at this uh, because this is something that, that should be called. 
So typically we, we want blocks in the back to have an effect on the play, but, but only to a certain extent. I mean, there comes a time where the block just is, is too big for us to ignore. And I think this one is, is one of those situations. Uh, everybody is looking and this is really solid contact. And even though it doesn't have an effect on, on the play, I think we, we need to call something like this just to, to keep control of the game. If we let this go, then the, the, the teams, we run the risk of the teams uh, losing faith in our ability to control the game. So uh, we do want, uh, as a general rule, we do want uh, blocks in the back to have an effect on the play unless they, they become so big that, that we need to call this. And again, is, is this a... Uh, a blindside block I don't think it is because I think most of the the contact is with the hands and the arms uh, but but this is a a block in the back that we need to call and and compare this one to the next play so in this example we're looking at white 23 so the fourth player in from the bottom and we're, again, we're looking at a block in the back that may not have an effect on the play, uh, but it's simply too big. It's simply too much in the point of attack. And when it happens right there, the runner is, is 10 yards away from him or maybe even more, but it's right there where uh, the runner is going to go. And, and everybody is looking here and the, uh, we've got serious uh, good contact in the back the guy goes down and uh, he certainly would have had a chance to get in there and and make a tackle uh, so whether you rule that this is uh, this has an effect on the play or not this is simply too big just like the previous one where we can we can leave it alone so so this one should have been called for a block in the back and who can see this uh, most likely the uh, depending on the size of the crew if this is a crew of eight uh, the back judge who's coming in from this sideline that would be in his area of responsibility possibly the umpire would also be looking there but those are the ones that we would be asking to to cover this up So we're talking about uh, the block that, and that we want it to have a have an effect on the play. Here, we're obviously looking at the at the, the players at the bottom again. We have the Oreo cookie. It's easily uh, easily recognizable here, and we're going to have a block in the back, and then the guy makes the tackle. So um, we can we can ask the question: Do we really need? to call this and and it was called here and it's it's tough to say that this is an incorrect call uh, however if if we were to wait half a second so we see this this block but if we were to wait half a second and see well he made the he made the tackle so uh, the 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 red jersey really won well, then maybe this is one of those that we can let go because it didn't have an effect on the play. And it's, you know, it's something that, that, that you can probably explain to a coach and say, well, I saw the block, but he, I also saw him make the tackle. So that's why we didn't call it. And I would be, I would be fine with that also. In this last example, we're looking at the receiving team number 77. So red, 77, and uh, he's right there. And he's gonna do a little push there, but this really illustrates very well how we want it to have an effect on the play because this is clearly in the back, but at the time when it happens, the runner has already passed. So it never had an effect on the play. It never affected black number eight's ability or, or chance to make a play uh, on the runner. So, so this is what we mean uh, when we say that, that it has to have an effect on the play. And, and, and you know, if you just see those two players isolated, 
and you see that push. That is certainly in the back, uh, and that might prompt a, a flag to be thrown. Uh, so what we're asking is is to to put it into context of the rest of the play and and realize that in this situation it has no bearing on the play so we can uh, leave it alone or just do a a talk to and that was the training tape i hope you found something that you can use on the field